Repo Man is a science fiction black comedy released in 1984, directed by Alex Cox. Young punk Otto, played by Emilio Estevez, is fired from his job at a supermarket. He finds a new calling as a repo man after he's tricked into stealing a car by a guy named Bud, played by Harry Dean Stanton. So he tags along with Bud and Otto learns some valuable life lessons alongside repossessing cars. He then gets entangled in the search for a Chevy Malibu, which was last seen in Roswell, New Mexico. It has a strange driver and some possibly even stranger cargo. Only an asshole gets killed for a car. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, Reaper Man. I chose this one because I've one of my favourite, if not my favourite film. I I just love, I adore this film. It's I kind of, I've seen it so many times and every time it doesn't disappoint. Sid and Nancy, I've kind of watched and fallen in and out of love with that film. But this one, consistently I've stayed with it. And this time again, I, count, I don't know how many times I've seen this movie, watch, watching it again for this, still love it. <laughs> It's completely absurd. It's very funny. It's kind of anarchic science fiction, if there is such a genre. Yeah, a bit satirical. Be, it's satirical. It kind of, for me, falls a little bit in with films like Hardware, that we covered, mm -hmm. Mad Max. It's kind of rebellious. Mm. Similarities going through these films. It's strange because it's kind of anarchic, but then it also, you know, they're repossessing cars on behalf of... That, well, they corporations are. that well, yeah, are owed money that's so true. they're that's... kind of towing the, the line really, kind, kind of although they're they're kind of a um uh, well, as alex cox himself said they're kind of the cowboys of yeah. these so the film itself is based on well he went out he went out he had a friend of a friend i think a man named mark lewis and he went out spent three months with this guy just kind of driving around and basically repossessing cars mm. you know they are cars that have, have been repossessed because the owners have kind of defaulted on their payments somewhat and uh, they they come in i suppose they're a bit like debt collectors aren't yeah, they bailiffs bailiffs so he went out and he spent a number of months and, and kind of doing doing it with the guy you know and that's where this film came from is where the idea of this film came from and in fact a lot of the a lot of the stories that this guy told him wound up being in the movie and a lot of the dialogue a lot of the dialogue in in the movie you know that repo men get into tense situations the asshole you know no asshole gets killed for a car all these lines that are in the movie came from this guy that he mm. just kind of wrote down all these notes as he was going, which is, you know, which is pretty cool. On top of that, it's got, you know, other things going on inside of it as well. Uh, so there's this really great movie. And I only found this out a few years ago. I mean, I've, I've been watching this film probably for 25 years, maybe more. Um, but only a couple of years ago, I found... That's right, there was an old movie drone clip on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's the only place you can see that, that show now. And of course, Alex Cox presented a number of them. He did a, a one or two series of them, along with Mark Cousins, who did the other one. And they introdu he introduced his film, Kiss Me Deadly, which is his 1955 film noir. Mm. That film is basically about a guy who is searching for something that he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's searching for, but it's worth a lot of money. There's kind of this box, and they're not sure, he's not sure what's in this box, but it's worth a lot of money, so he's kind of going on this journey to track it down. Criterion, I've got a copy of it, so I bought that. It was just incredible. It was just so incredible. But it's like, wow, that's, that's Reaper Man. Yeah, yeah. Because in Reaper Man, you've got this guy who is basically searching, well, this, this group of men, who are searching for this this old uh, 1964 Chevy Malibu. Yeah, and the bounty on it is $20,000, which is far more than the car is actually worth. Yeah, exactly, so. exactly. So it was a combination of him going out and, and working as a repo man and this story from this film as well. And I think Pulp Fiction also borrows mm. a little bit of the same idea there as well which is quite cool it's very independent yeah this movie i mean alex cox obviously is british going out making his first well he made a film at ucla called edge city and then he made this is like his proper first debut film although it feels independent but obviously it was it was released by universal which uh, who didn't really know what to do with it at first. no no exactly well i mean i mean i say independent but i mean it's got it's obviously got a, a quite a big budget yeah um probably a, a much bigger budget than he would have had at film school hmm. so yes yeah, it's, it's kind of independent but but not independent i mean he's actually i've got this book I've got this, i was going to bring this out later but i've got this amazing book which some of you may know if you're a fan of alex cox uh it's called x films and it's a really really cool book all about his films and he talks a lot in here about repo man uh, as well as other, other films and he kind of talks in there about like the first day on set for instance when he goes down there and he's like he couldn't he was amazed at how many trucks you need to make a movie mm. They're like driving down, there's like trucks for costume, there's trucks for catering, there's all these different vehicles. And he's kind of talking about kind of entering the world of 
of cinema, mm. you know, the difference between film school and, and then cinema itself. So yes, I mean, he's a, he, he, he talks of himself as being a rebellious filmmaker, um, but with a budget, I suppose. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you're fans of films like Mad Max and Hardware and, and any of those kind of 80s science fiction, satirical black comedy films, there are quite a few of them around in the 80s, mm. then this probably float your boat. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously we're in 1984, so we're in the Reagan era, yeah. when obviously there was a lot of affluent people around yeah. and a lot, you know, that was reflected in some films. You know, often the films would show a sort of glamorised version of America, which this certainly doesn't. It no. It's the opposite. So. No. And, and, you know, it wasn't the only film that did that. So um, you know, I guess something like The Warriors, maybe. Um, obviously, that was 70s, but but um, late 70s. So, yeah, the sort of gritty underbelly of American cities, I guess, is what Yeah, I mean, even, is. I mean, Terminator came out this year as well. and that's, yeah. But that, again, it's got that kind of gritty underbelly mm. view of America that obviously a film like Back to the Future that also came out, and that was 85, wasn't it? The other films that came out that we grew up with mm. showed, you know, a kind of more affluent, rich society, whereas, yeah, these were showing the, the grittiness. I mean, this film, I, I, I find another, another thing, is kind of an outsider movie, and that's not just Alex Cox being an, an outsider, but even, you know, the character of Otto. I mean, he is he joins this kind of merry bunch of repo men who are much older than him. He clearly has a problem with authority, doesn't he? has a problem with that, that too. I mean, at the beginning of the film, when he's first introduced, he is a listener of punk music mm. itself, is kind of being an outsider if you listen to that kind of music. But the whole film, I mean, even with his parents, when he, he goes home at one point, and his parents are kind of, they're kind of like these outcasts from the 60s, you know, sitting on their sofa, stoned, watching, you know, 80s television. And he, again, is kind of an outsider to his own family. So the whole film, he kind of feels like an outsider to everything. And as I think Alex Cox was as well. I mean, he was kind of a Brit going into America. A strange time for cinema, I think. Mm. It's, it's quite cool. It it's also feels quite like a lot of the films that came out of the early 70s by people like Dennis Hopper and Monte Hellman and people like that. So it's kind of independent. Mm. But, I mean, I suppose, I suppose when you talk about being rebellious, it's, it's the way these films were maybe shot you know, going out on the fly, just trying to shoot things as, as they can. I mean, there's a great scene here where they're driving down a street and Harry Dean Stanton leans over and turns his car off and then Emilio Estevez kind of gets out of the car annoyed and you can see all the people in the background clearly aren't paid extras <laughs> because they just like turn around and they're like, what the hell's going on here? It's hilarious and the camera's obviously in the car, there's no cameras around the car, everything's shot inside the car. That kind of, you know, kind of guerrilla filmmaking, which which is quite fun, which mm. you got a lot of, I think, in the 70s and 80s. But uh, had you seen this before? Once, yeah. Once. So it's my second time watching it. Okay. I mean, I thought maybe I had it on VHS, but I can't remember. Maybe I saw it on Channel 4 or something. It's, you know, it's definitely a sort of film that Channel, Channel 4 would yeah, show absolutely. late at night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd definitely seen it before. I didn't particularly... It, it was okay, but I, oh, it's, okay. it's so long ago that I saw it. I right. just remember not being particularly fussed. I thought, okay. It was all right, but... No, I definitely enjoyed it a lot more this time. I mean, okay. it's still... Oh, cool. When it gets a bit trippy towards the end, it kind of lost me a little bit. <laughs> I enjoyed it before cars start flying and things like that. Oh, cool. <laughs> when they're just driving around and, and just talking about life and, you know, the, just those conversations are the, the most amusing bits to me. Uh, and just Otto, you know, Emilio Estevez is so, it's such a fun role. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I love the way his attitude when he's, when we first meet him in the supermarket, he just yeah. doesn't care. No. <laughs> just hates the manager and just like, yeah. whatever, yeah. see you later, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I love that. Yeah, just, he's really cool. And obviously, Harry D. Stanton is, is great in it as well. So, no, it's lots of fun. And, yeah, the weirdness with the with the car and what's in the boot and the way, the fact that it vaporises people when they open the boot. For me, it got a little bit too weird towards the end and I started to lose, not lose interest, but I don't know, I just, I enjoyed it earlier. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I enjoy the whole film. Yeah. I enjoy everything about, about the film. You're right, though. I think that, I mean, we obviously did Young Guns a few weeks ago. Mm. Uh, Emilio Esther is, was in that as well. This was his first, not his first film, but this was his first kind of leading role yeah, yeah. in a film. I mean, I, I've always been a fan of his work. I think he's, he's great. He's great mm. here. He's got that kind of maniacal laugh that he had in Young Guns, the kind of people know him from playing Billy the Kid mm. is here as well. It's, mm. it's his laugh. You should have trademarked it. It's a great laugh. Uh, it's kind of this, this tackle that's you know, it's just so cheeky and, and rebellious himself. And he's yeah. so like his father as well, actually. I mean, obviously, Charlie Sheen, similar as well. But Emilio Estevez is so like, if you watch kind of early Martin Sheen films. <coughs> the old train. 
as weirdly that was kind of that fit into seven a few weeks ago and mm-hmm. it kind of fits into this as well because there's a great scene here on a train track where Otto is kind of walking down reciting TV Party by Black Flag, which is a great <laughs> moment as well. But yeah, I mean, you know, Emily West was playing, um, sorry, I was talking about Martin Sheen, you know, mm. Badlands and Apocalypse Now mm. and all these films, uh, which, you know, I think Emily West was clearly, yeah, came from good blood. I mean, it was a shame he sort of, I mean, obviously he, he went behind the camera for, for a while. He didn't did. He? And it, yeah, it's a shame we didn't see him on screen much sort of in the, after the sort of, 90s really I mean, he was in Mission Impossible briefly wasn't he and then yeah, he was. didn't really see him in much after that no. particularly so um, I've seen a couple of his directed films they're, yeah. they're okay they're alright I watched The Walk was it The Walk? The Big Walk The Long Walk not The Long Walk A Walk <laughs> something goes, about walking something about walking well, I mean he his character he's in I think he's in the beginning and he dies right well no he's not in the beginning he's, he's just directed it he's, he's out you know his character has died. Right. And his father, Martin Sheen, right. in real life, plays his father in the film, oh, okay. goes on this long walk in Spain. He's going to go on this walk, I think. Or does he go on the walk and then dies on the walk? I can't remember. It, it was all right. It was okay. Yeah. And like you say, Harry Dean Stanton, I mean, he's great here. Apparently, Alex Cox and Harry Dean Stanton really see eye to eye. Oh, right. I think Harry Dean Stanton's quite a... I mean, he's 58 when he made this film. Mm. I mean, he's amazing. And he died, he died like, what, 2017? And he was, you know pretty old when he did this film and this film was like nearly 40 years ago <laughs> crazy man I mean just a, an incredible actor that turned up in so many films mm-hmm. in his lifetime Paris, Texas and Alien being kind of two standout roles but many, many films he turned up in mm. and he's great fun here and I think he's he probably was one of those actors that caused a lot of because he was so good and because he was so you know kind of one of those actors that really gets into his into his role mm. it's great it's, it's very funny it's got some very funny moments in here uh, some wonderful performances by you know many actors that have kind of turned up uh, in the past um, in other in other great roles too and uh, a lot of newcomers I mean there's, there is a big as I mentioned you know there is a big link to punk music the yeah it's a great the soundtrack LA is a great soundtrack mm-hmm. here like Iggy Pop doing the kind of the, the theme tune the opening credits song and uh, got Black Flag in there and the Circle Jerks and in fact their bass player plays Kevin the mm-hmm. um, his friend at the beginning of the movie some great scenes with those two together and then this weird guy Dick Rude who plays his mate who goes off and those three are just hilarious <laughs> Dick Rude and Archie and Debbie those characters are just so bizarre I mean they're all kind of well Dick Rude's not the greatest actor in the world but uh, but that's kind of makes it that's what makes it a joy you know that even some of the acting's not great but that's cool I mean mm. some films yeah, when the acting's bad that kind of can be annoying but here it just kind of works the way they are the way they interact with each other it's just so much fun I was just reading he went off to do he did some Red Hot Chili Peppers videos he directed yeah. Catholic School Girls Rule and Fight Like a Brave Fight what's it called? Fight, fight Like a Brave Fight, like a brave. fight yeah. like a brave yeah that one too so yeah. old school chili old peppers. school chili preppers uh, so lots of interesting people in this film lots of great little scenes I just really enjoy it. and I even went on a I went down an internet rabbit hole <laughs> with Repo Man <laughs> Because in it, there is... So, I mean, obviously, we're in the 80s, and like you say, it's Reagan, and but there's consumerism as mm. well. And you've got these... All over the film, you've got these product packaging of, like... Uh, yeah. You know, this, so it's the white package with the blue stripe, and then just, like, food. So he's, yeah, when yeah. he goes to his parents' house, he takes out this canned food from the fridge, and it's just got food on it. <laughs> it's just this very generic mm. packaging. So if you know... John Lydon's band, Public Image Limited, their fifth album, entitled album, used the same right, yeah. imagery. So I thought, what is this imagery? I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this and it took me down a rabbit hole because it was actually so there was a shop, there was a supermarket called Ralph's right. in America, and they specialised in a in a beer which used this kind of generic and it was, that's what it was known as. It was generic it was a generic product basically. Uh, and I found a whole article on it. It was fascinating. I couldn't believe well, it. So it just said beer on it. Didn't it it just said, I think it just said beer, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Tesco Value because their uh, packaging is white with like, I think it's got blue and red stripes. Yeah, on it. it's kind of, yeah, it's just, it's just a kind of generic branding, yeah. you know, for, for stuff. Well, I'm glad I checked it out again because, um, yeah, I definitely enjoyed it more this time. Criterion did Reaper Man. Yeah. Well, I've got the Eureka version because obviously over here, a lot of Criterion desks 
they do their UK version. Yeah, of we them. don't get everything. We that don't get everything. Does, no. no, so I've got the Eureka one, which I don't know if I imagine it's maybe the same. It's got. I think the the Criterion one came out a year later, so it's got a couple of extra things on it. I think there's an interview with Iggy Pop. Apparently, the picture is slightly better. It's opened up as well, so it's you know you've got a very thin because it's one eight five. It's got very thin black bars. The Criterion has opened up slightly more, so it's completely fill. You know, if you've got a widescreen TV, it completely fills the screen. Obviously, that's not the original ratio, but yeah, the, apparently the picture quality is slightly better than the Eureka but you've got different booklets as well that's got its own booklet with like essays and stuff in it but the booklet in that is actually was actually done by Alex Cox so it's a bit more crazy and it's got like cartoons and yeah. all sorts of mad stuff in it but obviously Criterion would be locked to region A and the Eureka one is locked to region B so um, unless you can play both and can take your pick then you'll Stop with that. I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought you'd still be able to get the booklet version uh, yeah, unless you seek it out on eBay or something like that because the booklets are usually limited. Yeah, the, I mean, their cover is quite it's quite simple, actually, on the Eureka mm. one. I think on the Criterion one, they use more of the kind of the opening credits of the film. It's yeah. a little bit more like, like a that. map, but in the and shape then there's of a, a punk yeah, hairstyle with a green. skull. And, yeah, that's right, that's that one. It's a cult film. It's yeah. become a cult film. I mean, it's quite it's iconic, I think. I'm sure there's a... A lot of people out there who obviously will know it and yeah. will like it, and uh, maybe some of you don't like the end as much, like Simon here. But um, <laughs> it's fine. It just didn't, yeah, just didn't do it for me. Yeah, as I much as it does it for you, obviously. <laughs> oh, I just, I mean, it goes, it does go pretty wacky. This yeah. film. I mean, the whole film's pretty wacky, and I, I just think, you know, I mean, even that. I mean, the car when the car is illuminated. It was it wasn't even special effects. They just painted it. Yeah, well, I thought, paint, I thought they probably which did. Which is amazing yeah. <laughs> because it just, but it, it works so well. Mm. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it more this yeah. time. Yeah, no, I must, I must check out some more Alex Cox films because I've only seen that and, and Sid and Nancy. So I quite like to watch Walker because in, there's an intro on that disc with Alex Cox and he's got the poster behind him. It has. Um, well, yeah, yeah, it's quite a cool poster. Uh, interestingly enough, Criterion about to release that in the States. Reaper Man and Sid and Nancy are probably the, the ones I've seen the most. Mm. He kind of gets more and more weird yeah. as he goes along. Um, and he kind of just writes, he's written a few books now, that one and, and, and some others. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. And he, he's, there's, there's, some, there's a couple of interesting interviews with him I've seen on YouTube. Uh, Mark Commode has interviewed him a few mm. times and he's always really interesting to listen to. He's, he's got a big laugh. He's a little, little bit like Tarantino. He's kind of a, almost like a cinephile yeah, a little yeah. bit. You know, he's very well-versed in, in films and, and things that he's kind of has have inspired him and that he just enjoys in general. So I've, it's interesting. I've actually, although I've watched this film many times over the years, I've been reading all these tidbits about it this mm. time, just doing bits of research for this for this video. And the other thing that came out was, I mean, obviously the cinematographer on this film is Robbie Muller, who's famously kind of main, works a lot with, with Vim Vendors and Jim Jamoosh. But another guy on this, one of the camera operators, is a man named Robert Richardson, mm -hmm. who went on to work with people like um, Martin Scorsese and Tarantino. He worked on a lot of cinematographer for a lot of Tarantino films. It's interesting where, you know, where people start from, you know, yeah, obviously yeah. you've got a big name as a cinematographer anyway. But then you've got other people working as, you know, other technicians or crew. And then they obviously work their way up and, and become big names themselves. So I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, I think it's great. I think it's really nicely shot, this film, as well. Mm. There's a really great scene. I mean, there's a great, there's a whole sequence which is set on the, what is it? It's the, um, it's the same place I think they shoot Terminus. It's those, like, waterways, isn't it? Oh, yeah, LA, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which uh, they have used in countless films over the years. But there's this great shot where the camera's like on one of the bridges and it looks down and you see the whole the whole thing mm. opened out as the cars are racing up there. And that just looks really cool. I mean, you know, I didn't mention that too. I mean, it is a car movie. You know, cinema, American cinema and its love for cars is just exquisite. And mm. so many films get it so right. And it's odd cars. I've, I've always found that cars and f cars go well on, on films. Yeah, I yeah. mean, just look at Mad Max and Two Lane Blacktop, which you're not such a fan <laughs> of. Vanishing Point and all the kind of screwball crashing car films mm. of the 1980s and 70s. And the, in this, you know, there's some wonderful shots of cars in this movie yeah. up close and far away and from inside. And there's something kind of not erotic, but weirdly, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> No, I don't know. Car porn? Car porn, there maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. But uh, I think the Americans, the Americans specifically, and the Australians, seem to get it right. Yeah. And then we get it quite as right over well, here. Well, they've got lots of wide open spaces. They do, they? wide open spaces. don't have as many here. No, I had this conversation with my brother once, actually, that um, 
we can't do them as well because we have hedges. Yes, there's lots have and lots of hedges. Lots of hedges, so you can't put a camera because there's always a hedge in the way. Yeah, yeah. In America, there's like no hedges, so you can put the camera right over just there and weeds. just watch them all. Yeah, exactly, flying past. So I think it was originally well. planned as a road movie. Budget constraints, it, it, it was just fixed in LA. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, the whole, the whole film takes place in, in LA, apart from that opening shot which is out more in a little bit of the desert when the uh, cop looks in the boot and uh, gets fried people just explode sometimes natural (laughs) causes great film yeah and that was reaper man and as always if you enjoyed the video let us know in the comments below hit the subscribe button up there and don't forget to push the bell for notifications there's some other videos to check out over there come and find us on social media and join us again soon for another video